it's good to have you with us. We are going through verse by verse. That's part of the Calvary Chapel style of ministry. Uh, whatever book we're in, we go verse by verse through that book. And we are in Exodus chapter 20 as we're looking at the Ten Commandments. Uh, we're slowing it down a little bit as we go through the Ten Commandments. The title for this is 567 Bookum Dano. Now, I have no idea how I came up with that title. I know it's really stupid, but 567, that's the commandments we're looking at. And I should have just said commandment 5, 6, and 7. But we're all guilty. We're all sinners. And you're some of you are familiar with the old Hawaii 5 show, Bookum Dano, because you're guilty. And they're usually guilty of murder. And so we'll, that's one of the commandments. So that was dumb. So anyway, bear with me. Uh, we are currently looking at these Ten Commandments. As we've seen, the Israelites have been camping out around Mount Sinai in present-day Saudi Arabia. They've been there for about three months. Well, they've left Egypt about three months earlier. They will be in this place for about a year, and that's how long the Lord will be speaking to them, and all kinds of amazing things will happen while they're camped out here. But an amazing time for two and a half to three million Israelites um, who are literally out in the middle of one of the most desolate places on planet Earth. There's no natural resources there. There's no water. There's no food. Um, but God alone, he would sustain them. He would protect them. He would provide for them. Again, they've only left Egypt about three months earlier. But God has done some awesome things in their lives. Remember that they were slaves in Egypt for about 400 years. And God said he was going to use Moses. He called him, and then he's using him to be the deliverer that would bring them out of Egypt, eventually taking them up to the promised land. Moses, Moses can't go in, but that's later on in the story. But God alone would just do everything for the Jewish people. He told Moses, stand before Pharaoh and demand to let my people go so they could go out in the wilderness and worship the Lord. But Pharaoh refused. He said, no way. So God poured out 10 horrible plagues upon Egypt and the people. And it wasn't until the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn throughout all of Egypt of animals and people that he finally said, okay, get out of here. And so they leave. But even as they leave, then they get cornered. The Lord led them to the edge of the Red Sea where they're boxed in. And even then, it was God's going to be at work because Pharaoh hardened his heart again, says, I'm going to slaughter. That's nothing new. I'm going to slaughter the Jewish people. And so he's going after them, wants to kill them all. But then God parts the Red Sea. The Jewish people walk on dry land across the Red Sea. God closes the water down upon the Egyptian army. All of them, it says, are drowned in the depths of the sea. But again, the Israelites, they're out in the middle of nowhere, no food, no water, no shelter from the desert sun, but God. And that could be the subtitle for this message, probably a better title, but God, because God is going to do amazing things in their lives. He would protect them with the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. He would feed them the original Wonder Bread, manna from heaven, or angel food cake, take your pick. But every morning, God provided them with manna. When they were thirsty, God told Moses, strike the rock, and he struck it once, and water started gushing forth from that rock. And even where they're uh, camped out, that water would flow right past them. Uh, Paul says that rock is Christ, and so the Lord was present with them. They're at Mount Sinai. This is the mountain that God would descend upon and where Moses would meet the Lord. And as we saw last time, when God came down upon Mount Sinai, there was thunder, there was lightning, there, there was fire, there was smoke. It says the mountain shook and trembled. And with a loud voice that all could hear, God begins to give them the Ten Commandments. And the first thing that we saw he, telling, he told them was, I am the Lord your God, verse 2, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So even before any of the commandments, he reminds them, I am the Lord your God. I'm doing this for you. I'm your God, and you will listen up. I'm going to give you these commandments. And this was to be a blessing to the Jewish people and to all the world. But he says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now we saw that the first four commandments 
um, are all about our relationship with the Lord. And the next six that we'll start looking at this morning are all about our relationship with other people. Jesus summed up the entire law by saying to that Pharisee who asked Jesus, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? You know, the Jews had come up with 613 by this time, and so he wants to know what is the greatest commandment out of the 613, and this is what Jesus tells him, Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so again, these next six that we look at, it's all about loving others. But most of us should know by now that if our relationship with the Lord isn't where it needs to be, if our relationship with Jesus isn't priority number one, then these next six will be impossible to fulfill or keep. Because if our relationship with others is first, then our relationship with God isn't where it needs to be. He needs to be first and foremost. And then the rest of these things will make sense. They'll fall into line, and then we can be obedient to the Lord and walk the way He wants us to walk. So that brings us to commandment number 5. Look at verse 12. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So take note of that. A relationship with other people begins in our homes. It starts with those we live with. It starts with those who know us best. It starts with those who know us at our worst. Now, isn't it true that it's easier being a Christian when we're hanging around other Christians, especially at church? Hey, it's pretty easy, you know, to be with other Christians for an hour, hour and a half. You can smile. You can say, hey, everything's good, you know, and you can be patient. You can be kind. You can hold out for about an hour and an hour and a half. But do you know who I would love to meet? The family that has never in their life been in an argument on their way to church. That would be amazing. I mean, think how stressful it can be to young families trying to get their little ones ready to go to church. I mean, I can remember when our daughters were little, and, you know, before I was a pastor, I better say that first, um, we're trying our hardest to get to church on time, and then, you know, Bethany would have a blowout or something. You can learn that. Bethany actually thought that was funny, first service. She was here. Uh, Christina would lose a shoe or something. And, you know, I'd be all frustrated and I'd be like, come on, good grief, hurry up. We got to get to church so we can worship God. You know, and you're all stressed. And yet the family structure is the first commandment dealing with loving others, as we see here. It makes a lot of sense because the family unit is really the heart of any community. It's the heart of any society. This also is a reason why Satan is constantly attacking the God-ordained structure of what a healthy family is. But if you want a good culture, if you want a good society, it starts within the home. Honor your father and your mother. Sounds pretty simple. It seems so basic, but young children need to obey their parents. And as they get older, they need to honor or respect their parents. That means to revere your parents. Again, marriage and the family, it's a divine institution that was created by the Lord. He's the one who has defined marriage, not culture. He's the one who defines family, not the culture around us. He's the one we should always be looking to for guidance and strength and love and patience as it pertains to our families. God has given us the greatest instruction manual there is for family and marriage, and that's his word, period. Don't go outside the bounds of God's word. If anything you read contradicts God's word, don't listen to it. Now, when you think of the ways that God reveals his nature and his character to us, we see that Jesus is the ultimate groom. We are his bride. And so we can learn a lot about a husband-wife relationship based on our relationship with Jesus. 
God the Father is the ultimate father. We can learn a lot about how we are to deal with our children because God is the perfect father. Ephesians 5.24, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That's impossible on your own. We need the Holy Spirit to be able to love our wife Wives, love your, your husband just as Christ loves you. That means in exactly the same way Jesus loves you, that's how we're to love our spouse. I can't on my own. That's why I need the Holy Spirit working in me and through me. It's, it's so basic. It's so necessary. So think of all the ways that Jesus sacrificially gave himself for you and me. Again, what love, what grace, what patience what compassion, what mercy he has shown us. And then think of all the ways our Heavenly Father has blessed us, how he's encouraged us, how he has protected us, how he's provided for us, how he comforts us in our time of trial, our struggles, our troubles. Also, as our Heavenly Father, there have been times when the Lord needs to discipline us. And, and don't despise the discipline of the Lord. He only disciplines us for his, or for our benefit, for our own good. A, a discipline is what every child needs. The word discipline simply comes from the word to disciple, to train, to raise up your children, to discipline them in the ways and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. So proper discipline is a key component to that end. Now, how you go about that is extremely important, but I'll say consistency and discipline is one of the key elements. What you say and what you do needs to be consistent. It's so important for the training of a child. It's the parent's responsibility to train up a child, not the school. It's the parent's responsibility to train up the child, not the government. It's your responsibility as parents. One of the keys is to avoid the extremes. In other words, not every action requires a spanking. Sometimes they just need to be told what is right and wrong. Children need to be encouraged when they do what is right. Some of us never had any encouragement growing up. Anything we did, it was always pointed out what we did wrong, but nothing about what was right. But we are never, ever to beat a child. Again, I'm glad God doesn't beat me every time. I do something stupid or I say something wrong. I've made a bad decision. But the other extreme is to let children do whatever they want to do. That's not good either. They get away with any kind of behavior. Parents often ignore what their kids are doing. That doesn't do the child or anyone else any good. All you're doing is creating a little anarchist where they're doing what's right in their own eyes. And that's why Israel got in trouble so often in the book of Judges and it repeats it over and over again, everyone did what's right in their own eyes. And so God would discipline them. They would come under captivity. He'd raise up a judge. They'd be set free for a while. Then they'd start doing what's right in their own eyes. Again, consistency is so important. I've been around too many parents, and they'll tell their children, no, and if you do that again, you're in trouble. Two minutes later, no, and if you do that again and you're in trouble, no, if you do it, and they'll say it like five or six times. And I'm thinking, I'll do it. You know, let me at them. I mean, sometimes you just want to lay into that kid. But you know what? If you don't follow through, you're just creating a little anarchist. It obviously sends the wrong message, and you're simply training them to think, there's no consequences to my behavior. You know, there's always got to be consequences to our behavior, whether it's good or bad. This is what Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6 says. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening, that's discipline, of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And so I love the fact that God disciplines me because I know he loves me and he only wants what's best for me. And when your children understand that, it makes it a whole lot easier. Hebrews 12 verse 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, 
but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Many of us grew up with parents that failed greatly in their roles, and so it was hard to honor them. My parents were terrible. I mean, there's no other way to say it. They were just terrible parents. They had no clue how to raise me or my sisters, and I didn't honor them. I certainly didn't respect them at all until I got saved. And then when I got saved, the Lord changed my heart. Instead of being bitter and angry toward them, then I started to pray for them. I started to show the love of Jesus to them. And it wasn't until my mom was like 71. She lived the last 17 years of her life knowing Jesus. She got saved at 71. We had to lead her to the Lord, and the last 17 years of her life was great. She kept growing in the Lord. She, she just loved being here at church. She loved just knowing Jesus, and so she had 17 wonderful years. But if I contained or maintained that heart of bitterness because of what they did and how they raised us, there wouldn't have been any hope. You know, and some of you need to let it go. You know, your parents may have been royal jerks. Let it go. Pray for them if they're still alive. If they're not, let it go anyway. It's not doing you any good. It just eats away at your heart if you hold bitterness and anger towards your parents. By the way, notice that this is the only commandment that comes with this promise, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, God wants to bless his children. He has blessed us beyond anything that we deserve. But what a wonderful promise this is from our Heavenly Father. Bless your mom and dad, and I will bless you. Honor and respect them, and I will bless you. Now, this is not a universal promise that if you treat your mom and dad right, you're going to live to be 100 years old. That's not what he's saying. But God is specifically making this promise to the children of Israel. In other words, as long as you keep this commandment, you will experience a wonderful, blessed life in the land I'm giving you, which is where? Israel. That's the whole promise here. This is for the Jewish people. This will be a blessing to you. I'll bless you in your promised land. Unfortunately, there were times in their history when they did not treat their parents very well. Jesus even points this out in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 9. Check this out. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. That's what we're looking at here. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. That's later on. But you say, this is what Jesus tells these religious leaders, but you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. In other words, if a son became angry with his parents and he knew he was supposed to honor them, take care of them in their old age, help support them, they would say, Corban, it's a gift to God. Now I don't have to give anything to you. It all belongs to God. Even though they didn't give it to God, they would just hold on to it just for themselves. They might give a little bit here and there to the Lord, but Corban meant, no, oh, I've got this vow I've made to God and I can't break this vow. So they're putting that tradition ahead of God's word. There's a lot of denominations out there that put traditions ahead of the Word of God. Some of you grew up in some of these churches. They would have traditions that superseded the Word of God. It's like it says it right here. Yeah, but you know, the church says this, and we really hold on to these things. Be careful. Jesus says you cannot cancel out God's Word by coming up with your own traditions that are contrary to God's Word. So, anyway... The bottom line here with this commandment is to love, honor, and respect our parents in the same way that we should love, honor, and respect God, our Heavenly Father. For many of us, our parents are gone, and so in a sense, as parents, grandparents, we now are to love, honor, respect, and point our children, grandchildren to Jesus. That's still part of the plan here. 
Again, Jesus condensed all ten commandments into two, love God and love others. This fulfills all the law. So, let's look at commandments 6 and 7, verses 13 and 14. You shall not murder. If your old King James says kill, that's not the right word. We'll talk about that in a moment, but it literally is murder. And he says in verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Often we see these two commandments linked together throughout the word of God, murder and sexual sin. And when you think about it, Satan really zeroes in on these two particular sins. These sins are prevalent throughout the world today. In John 8, 44, the religious leaders are saying that Jesus was conceived by fornication saying, oh, Mary, she didn't get pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So they say, oh, he's a result of fornication. 844, Jesus tells religious leaders, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so Satan, from the beginning, has tried to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he accomplished in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Has God really said, did God really say these things? Surely you won't die, you'll become just like God. God was clear, Genesis 2, 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die and sure enough when satan got them to eat of that forbidden fruit they instantly died spiritually they died in other words their close personal relationship with god died and in a sense it was because they committed spiritual adultery they cheated on god they disobeyed the Lord, and they listened to the liar, Satan. We see these two commandments come to light in the life of King David. You remember how he lusted in his heart for Bathsheba? He watches her, and he calls, you know, bring her to me. He commits adultery, gets her pregnant, and she's married to this honorable guy named Uriah. And so David says, oh, man, I got to cover this up. So he puts Uriah on the front lines, and he tells the commander, all right, when the battle starts, pull away from him. And so Uriah was killed, struck down by arrows. So he committed murder, premeditated murder. And so he thought he got away with it for about a year until prophet, the prophet Nathan shows up, and he confronts David and proclaims, you are the man. And as a result, we have Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Great psalms because those are David's psalms of repentance. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So these two commandments that are often linked together are a huge problem in the world today. Violence, sexual sin, they are exalted all over, all over the world today. Even Jesus compared the last days to the days of Noah. And how is the days of Noah characterized? Well, this is right before God destroyed the world with a flood. We see that sexual immorality was rampant. It says the sons of God took the daughters of men, had children by them, which was not a good thing. And then a couple of verses later, it talks about the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. So sexual sin, violence, murder, it was all there at the, the time of Noah's flood. So with commandment number six, God simply says here, you shall not murder. In chapter 21, God will go into more specifics on what killing and murder and justifiable killing and manslaughter and accidentally killing somebody. He'll go into detail and break this down. Murder, the word he uses here, means premeditated murder. You're thinking about how am I going to kill this person? In fact, the first law that God established with Noah after the flood is found in Genesis 9. Look at these verses, starting in verse 5. It's taking an innocent life intentionally. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. From the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. 
for here's the reason why for in the image of God he made man and so capital punishment was set up as a deterrent to you know to another human being killing a human being why because only mankind is created in the image and likeness of God and as murder destroys an image bearer of God it is a direct assault to God himself think about that premeditated murder is a direct assault to God himself because we are all every human being is an image bearer of God this is why God hates abortion he despises abortion abortion is premeditated murder it's very clear in the scriptures life begins in the womb it's a direct attack on the Lord himself because that unborn child is created in the image and likeness of God check out these verses you're familiar with these Isaiah 49 verse 5 and now the Lord says who formed me from the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him for I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength so the Lord formed us in the womb and there's Jeremiah 1 5 before I formed you in the womb I knew you before you were born I sanctified you I ordained you a prophet to the nations and then one more David says in Psalm 139 starting in verse 13 for you formed my inward parts you covered me in my mother's womb I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth verse 16 says your eyes shall uh, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them so God is very clear when he created us in our mother's womb now some people have a problem with God killing others in the Bible he will tell Joshua when they come into the promised land you are to kill and he mentions all these different termites and parasites the Hittites the Canaanites the Jebusites why because they had had 400 years to repent and yet they got worse and worse and worse the things they did to other people and to their own people was brutal beyond anything we could imagine I mean they would torture children they would lock up children in walls as they're building a house they put their firstborn in there to keep the evil spirits away they were just wicked beyond anybody's imagination and God did not want them like a rabid dog if there's a dog fully enveloped with rabies and he was getting ready to attack your child what would you do oh nice little puppy no you would go after that dog you put it down if it kills if, if it doesn't you know if you don't put it down it's gonna kill your child or it could depending on where you're living so that's the way God treats these enemies of Israel if God is against murder though then how can you justify killing someone there are different Hebrew words for murder and killing and this is why I said when it says in the Bible thou shalt not murder he's using a Hebrew word ratza r-a-t-z-a-h and it means premeditated murder now when he talks about killing those sort of in retaliation he uses a different word harag h-a-r-a-g that's justifiable killing primarily against those who premeditate and murder that's the difference a perfect example of this is what we're seeing right now in Israel when 1400 innocent Jewish people were murdered by Hamas on October 7th that was Ratza premeditated murder they've even found plans going back a year ago detailing how they're going to break through what they're going to do to the people and it was brutal beyond anything we can imagine disgusting acts of violence against men women and children but what Israel has been doing is harag justifiably killing those who are trying to wipe out image bearers of God can you see the difference it's very important so anytime you hear someone going on about the need for Israel to stop going after Hamas they will talk about moral equivalence in other words Hamas 
killed 1,400 Jews. So Israel needs to stop because they've killed more Hamas and sympathizers than Israel. That's another example of man's philosophies trying to supersede God's word and God himself. Hamas c committed unjustifiable murder, but Israel is justifiably killing their enemies. So the Bible is clear. God is against murder, but there are times when killing is necessary. Again, God's word will go into a lot more specifics as he expounds on these things later on in the book of Exodus. What about in the New Testament? Well, the Apostle Paul, when he was arrested in uh, Acts chapter 25, uh, it's in verse 11, it's not on the screen, but he says, if I've done anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. Paul says, yeah, there are people that need to be put to death because they did something wrong. They murdered somebody. Paul says, hey, I'm not against the death penalty. If I've done something deserving of death, I'm not objecting to being put to death. Now, don't forget the standard for God's law is perfection. And the more you study God's law, the more you realize that you and I are not perfect. And so built into the law of God is an understanding, I need a savior. I need a substitute. I, I need somebody to stand in the gap. I, I'm going to need grace. I'm going to need mercy. I'm going to need someone to fulfill the requirements of all the sacrifices on my behalf. And as most of you know, that someone is Jesus. Jesus alone was sinless. Only Jesus lived a perfect life. Only Jesus fulfilled every single requirement of the law. Only Jesus fulfilled every single requirement of the sacrificial system of the law. So only Jesus could become the perfect sacrificial lamb of God who could take away the sin of the world. So the price that was paid for your sins, my sins, was his perfect spotless blood. There's no other way to be saved. You must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Now, again, we'll see a lot more details about this commandment as we go through Exodus. But thou shalt not murder, premeditatedly kill somebody. Look at verse 14. Real briefly, it says, you shall not commit adultery. A uh, simple definition of adultery is having sex with someone other than your spouse. This commandment by God was intended to protect the sacredness, the holiness of marriage, the marriage relationship that God established. God created it. It was the first institution that he started with Adam, with Eve in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2.24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And that oneness that is established by God, it's a holy sacred covenant that a man and woman enter into and sadly adultery rips at the very heart of marriage it does tremendous damage to the other spouse and i've been you know involved in too many situations over the years where i've seen the damage it can do to one or both spouses once again but god once again, but God. To the person who has been caught up and entangled in adultery or any other sexual sin, but God. God can forgive, but God can heal, but God can restore. And that goes for any other sin that you can think of. If a person truly turns to the Lord, repents of their sin, the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away any and all sin. doesn't matter what you've done. Well, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to know what you've done. God knows what you've done. And yet God is ready, willing, and he alone is able to forgive you of whatever you've done. He can forgive you no matter what sins you've committed. But you've got to come to Jesus. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from a little bit. But no, <laughs> cleanses from all unrighteousness. There's not one sin he cannot wash away from your life. And back in verse 7 of 1 John 1, it says, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us of all sin. 
So God is able to forgive you, but again, you must be willing to agree with God. That's what confession means. Agree with God. I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself, but I need to, I need to turn to Jesus. He's the only one who can save. So it doesn't matter how deep your sin goes. God's grace, his love goes deeper still. Don't ever forget that. How do we know that's true? Well, some of my favorite verses, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh-oh, I'm in big trouble. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor uh, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. No, now I'm in big trouble. Notice, this is for the believer, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Again, there is no one outside the bounds of God's grace and his mercy and his love and forgiveness. But you must admit your sin. You must agree with God. You cannot save yourself, but Jesus can save you. Jesus says very clearly in John chapter 6, verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I'll by no means cast out. So again, if you're willing to come to him, he'll hold on to you. He won't let you go, but you have to be willing to come to him. Now, God's law clearly says that if a person was caught in the act of adultery, they were to be stoned to death. That's how serious this sin was. Man, how many dead bodies would we have around us today if this was still the practice? I guess if you go to some countries, they probably take care of that this way. But every sin, again, any sin, big or small, they all lead to death. So it's not just, wow, I committed adultery, I deserve to be stoned. No, if you lied, you deserve to be stoned to death. If you stole a candy bar when you were a kid, you deserve to be stoned. Guess what? We're all born in sin. There's none righteous, no, not one. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. Don't forget these things. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Well, who's a sinner? Every single one of us. But the gift of God, and it literally means the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the good news. Jesus paid the price in full for all your sins. One of the greatest examples we see of this commandment and how they were trying to trip up Jesus when he was on earth, it's found with uh, the woman caught in adultery. Look at these verses, John chapter 8, starting in verse 2. This is where Jesus is at the Mount of Olives. And it says, early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Question, where's the guy? <laughs> You're going to catch somebody in the very act. There's two people here. Why do they only drag her before Jesus? So, Mo, and then they say, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him, in other words, if he says, yep, stoner, killer, then he would not be a friend to sinners. But if he said, nah, no big deal, don't listen to Moses, then he'd be contradicting the word of God. So Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Wow. That's putting it on the line. Okay, you think you're perfect? Okay, any of you perfect people, throw a rock at her. 
He's stooping on the ground. What is he writing? We don't know. What, you know, people speculate. What did he write? We don't know. Maybe the Ten Commandments. And he gets to this part here. Maybe he's writing their name with a secret sin they thought nobody knew about. We don't know. Whatever it is, he's writing on the ground. He says, he's without sin among you. Let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, hey, if you're without sin, throw a rock at her. Those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. So the older ones are probably thinking, yeah, I'm not perfect. Uh, yeah, I've definitely committed some sins. So they start leaving. The young bucks think, yeah, I'm still, no. They're, they're guilty too, but they all eventually leave. Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The word he uses for condemn is catacrino. It means no one can judge you that you deserve hell. Catacrino means damnation. I'm not sending you to hell. I don't condemn you. He also says, go and sin no more. He's not giving her a you know, free ride. Okay, yeah, go back to living any way you want. No, I don't condemn you. I'm forgiving you. But don't keep that practice up. Don't keep doing that. It's wrong. That's the bottom line. Now, if someone thinks, well, I'm not that bad. I've never murdered anyone. I've never committed adultery. I'm pretty sure I've kept most of the Ten Commandments. So I feel pretty good about my chances of getting through those pearly gates. If you think that way, you're only fooling yourself. Because God's word is clear that nobody can get to heaven on their own without Jesus. Again, there's no one righteous. No, not one. We've all sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Even James tells us, James chapter 2, verse 10, you can try to keep the whole law, and yet you stumble in one little point of the law. He says you're guilty of all of it. You're guilty of breaking it all. Even Jesus makes this perfectly clear in his Sermon on the Mount. And I'll close with this. You're going to have to turn your Bible open. You're going to have to turn some pages now. It's not on the screen. You remember how to do that, right? Matthew chapter 5. I love to hear the sound of pages. It's kind of taken some of the, for me, some of the blessing out of it when you don't hear pages, just like tap, tap, tap on your screen. Same Bible, though. It's good. It's all good. But when people think, well, you know what? I've never done this horrible. Thing. I've never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. That has nothing to do with me. Remember how I said these two often go together throughout the scriptures. These are the two commandments Jesus chooses to pick out when he defines what the law really is all about. People think it's just the outward action. I never did these things, so... Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, so now he defines, this is the real meaning behind commandment number 6. I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So he's saying, even if that anger is in your heart, you haven't killed anybody, but the anger is still there. That's where murder begins in the heart. That's where adultery begins. It all begins in our hearts. But it's in there, so we're all guilty of sin. So look at verse 27, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. Again, commandment number 7. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, the point is we're all guilty. If you're right, and you can try this at home if you want. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. 
For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And the point is, if you think, okay, my eyes cause me problems, I'll pluck it out. Well, I got another eye. That's causing me. I'll pluck that out. Oh, man. Better cut off this hand. Better cut off that hand. Foot. Where do you stop? I'd be a stump. I'm pretty sure most of us in here would be stumps if we think that's going to make us righteous, cutting off our body parts. No. It's having the Lord do surgery on our hearts, cutting out the wickedness of our hearts and filling us with His Holy Spirit because what's in the heart comes out of our mouth and that's when we can speak blessings to those around us and not be angry and bitter and all those type of things. So here's the mind blower of Matthew 5. Look at verse 48. We'll close here. This is how we know what Jesus is referring to. The last verse of chapter 5, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Anybody want to raise their hand to say, Yeah, I'm perfect, just like God. I'm perfect like God is. Nobody. We can't. That's his whole point. But that's why he came to die for you, to die for me, to shed his blood for our sins, to go to the cross and pay the price in full that we deserve because we've all sinned and rebelled against God. Jesus hanging on the cross, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father is pouring out his wrath, his judgment for sin upon Jesus as he hung on the cross. That's why it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus paid the price in full, took all the wrath and judgment I deserve for my sins. He took it upon himself. So now we can read it in Hebrews 13, 5 through 8, but he tells us, I'll never leave you or forsake you because you're in Christ. Jesus was forsaken in our place. He took the wrath and judgment I deserve, you deserve, for you. That's how much he loves you, folks. That's how much he cares for you. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did it all. Amen?